Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff Mom Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Do you know what today is, Samantha? What is today? I don't know. Wait, what? But it's time for another female first. <laughs> that was really anticlimactic. I don't know. I was really hoping it was, of course, it is a big day. That is the biggest day it's of our bi- month. It's true. It's true. However, I thought there was something else added. Maybe there's going to be cake I involved. actually am not. In, well, you know what? Next time, cake, <laughs> champagne. We'll do it right. Yes. We'll do it right. <laughs> Expectations are huge. Yes. We're going to build it up every time. But that means that we are joined once again by our friend and coworker, Eve. Eve. Hello. Hi. How so, are you doing, Eve? I'm good, but I have a request. If yes. there is cake next time, can it be cheesecake? Because I'm oh. not a, the hugest fan of other kinds of cake. Oh. So if we can do, if I can be that person and request oh. the cake oh. that comes. No, that's perfect can because it be uh, I'm the same way. Okay. And so my birthday is this month, y'all. Just so yes. you know, just heads up. Mm-hmm. And since I was 14 years old, because I did not like regular cake, mm-hmm. my birthday cake has always been cheesecake. So mm-hmm. every year... Yeah. I missed a couple of years because I couldn't go home. My mom would make me a fancy homemade cheesecake Aww, for my birthday. That's so really sweet. I like that. Yes. Yes, we will do cheesecake. Are you in on the cheesecake game too, Annie? Well, I am, but I actually have a very funny story about cheesecake because I once, when I was in <laughs> middle school, I bought an entire cheesecake from Kroger and it was a different chocolate flavor oh, yeah, every yeah. slice. Those, that little yeah, special tray. Me and my friend ate the entire thing while we were watching the Stargate movie with Kurt Russell. Oh. And James Spader, and we got very sick. Yeah. <laughs> and so I have an association. I just have to get past it. Like, every time I have the first bite, it's good. But, you know, there's that, like, <laughs> oh. nervousness in my stomach. Oh. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> but you are the, the winner. You get to make the request. Okay, cool. It will be a cheesecake. <laughs> I made cheesecake what kind, Do you like the toppings or do you like plain cheesecake? Let's I make do... a pretty good cheesecake, I will say that. Oh, yeah. A plain okay. or a strawberry. I don't really get much more interesting okay. than that. <laughs> yeah. So the reason I fell in love with cheesecake is because I watched my mom make it and I helped her make it. It's like these mini chocolate chips with the the chocolate crust that uh-huh. is my all-time favorite Ooh. and I don't like anything over that like I can mm-hmm. do some strawberries and all of that but I don't want to be all fancy with like Heathcliff ribbon bar <laughs> right. type of thing see that'll make my teeth fall out yeah my teeth we are already falling that. out it's an orphan thing <laughs> oh no yes I know y'all <laughs> well you're welcome <laughs> thank you cheesecake. I'm glad we have a cheesecake <laughs> aside <laughs> that used to be where my parents in college would be like meet us at the cheesecake factory and I'd be like uh, okay <laughs> Fancy. I know. That's super fancy. That's I mean, the like cheesecake a 50 was nice. page book. I know. The, the menu food. That's true. It overwhelms me. <laughs> it's, it's too, too much. much. It really is. I <laughs> right? agree with you there. We're on the same page. <laughs> but today we are not talking about just cheesecake. Okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. We'll return to that topic later. <laughs> Who did you bring us as our female first of the day? Eve? Ah, well, today's female first is Norma Merrick Sklarik. And she has a lot of firsts to her name, like a lot of them. But one of the biggest ones is that she was, well, she was one of the first black female licensed architects in the U.S. She wasn't the first one. A lot of places list her as the first, but she probably wasn't the first yeah. um, in the U.S. But she was the first black woman to be licensed as an architect in New York and in California. And she was the first black woman to be a member of the American Institute of Architects. And she was the first black woman to be appointed a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. So this one is, um, I guess, a little bit different than previous first, just because she died in 2012. So that wasn't that right. long ago. I think uh-huh. a lot of the people we covered in the past kind of like stuck to. But I think it's important to show that like this was a first that happened not too long ago. Right. And this is still a field that is very the number of black women, black people in general, let alone black women, mm-hmm. in the field of licensed architects in the United States is very small and disproportionate. Yeah. Um, and it's something that's growing, but like it's still it's still a small number of yeah. black women in the field. And yeah, so we're gonna talk about Norma today, which is she was, you know, a pioneer in the field and her story is pretty interesting. Yeah, um, it is pretty telling that um, it's such a recent first. And normally when we do these, I, I get a bunch of bullet points and I'm like, okay, here's the things that they've done. And this one is three pages long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did a lot right. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess let's get started. Let's get into let's it. Y'all, y'all ready? ready? Oh, yeah, so ready. <laughs> yes. 
So Norma was born on April 15th, 1928 in Harlem, and her father's name was Walter Merrick. He was a doctor, and her mother was Amy Merrick, and she was a seamstress, and they were both immigrants there from Trinidad, and she was their only child. And so she was raised during the Great Depression. Her family moved from Crown Heights in Brooklyn when she was a child, or excuse me, her family moved to Crown Heights in Brooklyn when she was a child. And her father got a medical degree from Howard University. Um, So when she was a child, she was already exhibiting all these signs that, like, would lead toward architecture. I don't know about y'all, but, like, architecture is very interesting. I could never, I could never do it. (laughs) Like, like, but I think it's amazing. Um, And just something that's grown, like become so innovative so quickly, Um, but just like it has so many different elements of things in it. Like there's the art, there's the math, there are the visuals and like, you know, just so many, the physics of it, like Mm -hmm. so many different things that go into it. And so as a child, she exhibited all these signs of being good in all these different areas. So she had this art thing, she sketched, she painted and she drew and she did carpentry work. She worked on furniture. Um, Yeah, so she was really a cool gal when she was young, and she went to a public girls' school called Hunter College High School, and she was a good high school student, too, in some of those same fields. She said that her grades were pretty good in pretty much (laughs) everything. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I know. But she was really good at art, the sciences, and math, which is still pretty much everything. (laughs) Right, yeah, that's all of it together. She's just good in general. Mm -hmm. But it was her father who suggested to her that maybe you should do architecture. And obviously then, as there aren't now, there weren't many black people who were in the profession, but that didn't keep her from pursuing it. So she wanted to go to Howard like her father did, but her father didn't want her to. Her parents wanted her to stay closer to home. And so to prepare for Columbia University's architecture program, she took liberal arts courses at Barnard College. And Barnard College was associated with Columbia University, but it was for women, like Mm -hmm. it was for women, as Columbia didn't accept women students. So she went through that, those courses, and then she got into the Columbia University School of Architecture. So... She remarked on how her first year there was super hard, Mm -hmm. but that didn't keep her from coming back after the summer. She came back in the fall. Because, like, many of her classmates were World War II veterans. Um, Some had bachelor's or master's degrees. So, basically, they had people around them, and they already had all this experience to be able to help them through the process of getting through these amazingly, I can't even imagine how difficult courses they were. Mm -hmm. Um, So those people would kind of work on assignments together, but she had this situation where she was commuting to school and sometimes had to finish her work on her commutes or at home alone. Mm -hmm. So that kind of having, we know like having, how having that support system is important when you're going through school. Right. Oh, yeah. She got her Bachelor of Architecture degree in 1950, and she was one of two women in her class and the only black one. After that, she applied to 19 architectural firms. She said in the interviews, like, I won't forget that number, 19. Wow. um, But was turned down to every one of them. Oof. Yeah, and she got hers on the she got the twentieth. But um, this is a quote that she said. She said, "I don't know if the rejections were because I was a black person, because I was a young woman, or because of the economic recession at the time." But she said that those places weren't hiring women or black people. So I think we can got to kind of go, hmm, like yeah, right. I think we know what the issue was here. Yeah. Um, the issues. Yeah. So she, her 20th one, that was when she went to work in the city of New York's Department of Public Works as what she says is a junior drafts person. Mm -hmm. And she didn't like that job because she couldn't really be creative in it. Um, So she wasn't there long. She took the New York State Architects Licensing Exam and she passed it on the first time, which everybody doesn't do, um, even though it was a really tough, days-long test, and she became a licensed architect in 1954, and that was when her first first comes along, Ah. (laughs) and she became New York State's first black woman licensed architect. So she was hired by a private architectural firm at that point after she quit her job with the city. Even though her supervisor gave her a bad reference... And her relationship with that supervisor, with her boss, wasn't, there wasn't anything wrong with it. So he, but he said that she was lazy. 
She got to work late a lot, that she didn't know anything about design and architecture, and that she socialized a lot. So he had a lot of really negative things to say about her, even though she never had any issues. And she thought it had to do with the fact that (laughs) her boss wasn't a licensed architect and was older, and she was a younger black and licensed architect. Mm. Um, So she still got the job. (laughs) She was a threat, Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm sure, like, old dude is like, man, I've done nothing. We feel this way similarly, but we don't lash out at we people and send them bad letters of recommendation. Just saying, I white man felt threatened. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so even though she got out of her old job because she felt like she was wasting her potential, she was still doing small tasks like designing bathroom layouts, so she still kind of felt, you know, a way about that. Mm -hmm. She spent a year at that small firm, and in 1955, she joined the office of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. She ended up working there until 1960, so that was a pretty big firm. Mm -hmm. And at that major firm, she was working on large-scale projects and teaching evening architecture courses at New York City Community College. And so around this time, she was a single mother of two children. She had already been married and been divorced, and her mother took care of her children while she worked, so she did have a support system. It's not like nobody was there while she was doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And in 1959, she became the first black woman to be a member of the American Institute of Architects. Boom. Boom. Wow. In 1960, that's when she moved to California. And there she took a job at Gruen and Associates in Los Angeles. And just a side note about Gruen, Victor Gruen was is the person who was credited with kind of being a pioneer in the American shopping mall. He did a lot of work oh, in that area. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think I talked about him recently. Yeah, the Because uh, we were talking about food courts on the other show I do. I was going to say, why are you pointing at me? I don't know that one. <laughs> You're not Lauren. <laughs> 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 yeah, shopping malls are... I feel... I don't know how sad I am about them leaving, but I do have I do remember the glory days of yes. going into the Disney stores. Oh yeah, yeah. and into oh, the yeah. jewelry stores, right? And Claire's. then having the double oh, yeah. layers, and then you see stores on top, yeah, and on bottom, and trying to figure out where to go, right? Getting a cookie in between. Always feeling like you were this close to like falling over the edge because they always had those on the top level, the like glass, and yes. I would always be scared. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's and not much. Everywhere you smell perfume. Every <laughs> so funny the things you. You're saying I think no one else would say okay, as like a then. plus of malls. <laughs> like you could look down and think you could look. fall. You could smell perfume everywhere. There were two thing. floors. Like, when you were like a little kid in a small town and all you see <laughs> is Walmart yeah. with three aisles and you come to a giant mall. That is you're like, fair. what? Yeah. Yeah. Um I went out well, you've been to China. I'm not sure if you you have. I have not. But they had a million shopping. I don't Yeah. They have so many malls. Mm-hmm. It is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And they're huge. Like, they're, there's a basement, and then there's a basement under the basement. Like. And they're so organized. <laughs> yes. karaoke they in are there? so organized. It probably is in some there's of them, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> like, they would name what the categories of things are on each floor when you got to that floor. Yeah. I was like, wow, oh, this is... that makes sense. This yeah. is very organized, and I like it. Anyway, it that, <laughs> off of that I shopping know. mall tangent. Yes. <laughs> Go to malls in China. Got it. <laughs> yes. You'll be there for the next 90 years. Mm-hmm. So when she was at Gruen, she recognized how much scrutiny she was getting from her boss there. She didn't have a car, and she got rides with one of her colleagues, who was a white man, to get to work. And later she said in an interview... It took only one week before the boss came and spoke to me about being late. Yet he had not noticed that the young man had been late for two years. Mm -hmm. My solution was to buy a car since I, the highly visible employee, had to be punctual. And uh, I think it's funny how she said highly visible employee. I feel like this is definitely skating around saying, oh, I was a black woman. Yeah. <laughs> I was like the only yep. one. They watched but, me to see me, my mistakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we, we get the subtext there. Mm-hmm. Uh, she got her architecture license in California in 1962. And so she was the first African-American woman to have one in California. And she remained the only one for 20 years. Oh, wow. So it was until the 80s? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Hey. That was a weird noise. 
<laughs> We're all about it today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of weird noises, Sorry. we should pause for an ad break. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So yeah, she she becomes the first, another first, another first black woman architect in California and stayed that way and for a very unfortunate yeah. long Remains time. Remains that way until the eighties. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And she was at that firm for a while too. After six years at that firm, she became the director of architecture there, and she hired people and oversaw staff and coordinated the technical aspects of some really big projects. And so some of her projects were California Mart, Fox Plaza, Pacific Design Center, San Bernardino City Hall, and the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Uh And her son said that she thought designing the building was the actual easy part of the job, while the production of it, all the other nuts and bolts that went into it, was the real work of the job. <laughs> I feel like it's easy to downplay. When you're, you've are you worked that hard to get to somewhere and yeah. in such a major position, it's easy to downplay and say, ah. Yeah. Right. I just knew what I was, you know, that's the easy part. But, yeah, I get how s- things like that have so many different moving parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So everybody's job is important. But, yeah, mm-hmm. so she got she got to that point, and for a lot of her career, she actually served as a project manager rather than a design architect, which was actually the case with many women architects who, work, who worked in corporate firms. So she didn't design most of the big projects that she supervised. And Marshall Purnell, who was a former president of the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, told the LA Times that she could design large projects, but that it was unheard of to have an African-American female who was registered as an architect. You didn't trot that person out in front of your clients and say, this is the person designing your project. So Marshall Purnell, who was a former president of the AIA, told the LA Times that she could design large projects, but, quote, it was unheard of to have an African-American female who was registered as an architect. You didn't trot that person out in front of your clients and say, this is the person designing your project. She was not allowed to express herself as a designer, but she was capable of doing anything. That's what Marshall Purnell said. Either way, she was a really good project manager, and she stayed with Gruen until 1980. And she got she was married several times throughout her life. During the time where she was at Gruen, she married Rolf Sklarik, an associate at Gruen, who died in 1984. So he died years after they married. In 1980... Here's another first. She became the first black woman appointed to the College of Fellows of the AIA. And she was the first woman in the Los Angeles AIA chapter to be given that honor. Ooh. Yeah. That same year, she became vice president at the Los Angeles firm Welton Beckett Associates. So she was a project director on Terminal 1 at Los Angeles International Airport, which was a $50 million project that she finished before the start of the 1984 Olympics. Oh, nice. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. This is another part of her life, which I think you two will really appreciate. Yes. Um, She co-founded the women-owned firm Siegel, Sklerik, and Diamond with Margot Siegel and Catherine Diamond. And that was the largest completely women-owned architectural firm in the U.S. at the time. Wow. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah, you would. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. She was the first African-American woman to co-own an architectural practice. Wow. Yeah. So many firsts. That so was in many. 1985. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The firm made a bunch of proposals. They made proposals on five projects, and it got all of those commissions. So they worked on the Tarzana Promenade, which was a 90,000-square-foot medical and retail center, and a remodeling of the Lawndale Civic Center. And they worked on additions to schools and other institutional buildings. So 1985, this was after her previous husband died. She married Dr. Cornelius Welch. So another marriage in her life. Mm -hmm. And she left Siegel, Sclerick, and Diamond in 1989, even though it was a really, you know, cool thing to do because even though they had these $50 million projects, they couldn't get the large-scale projects that she really wanted, and she missed that kind of challenge and the money that came with those projects, which Mm -hmm. is totally understandable. That's fair. 
Yeah. yeah. She became the principal of project management at the Jardy Partnership, which was a firm that was known for its design of public spaces. And while she was there, she helped design and construct the Mall of America Malls. in Minneapolis. More Come malls. back. Malls. I've never been to the Mall of America. Have I Neither have I. I have not. I've seen the Mary Kate and Ashley short video where they visited. Right. It's the best. Yes. Okay. okay, now I'm just annoyed. You've seen that, but not Anna Green Gables. <laughs> I've seen it multiple times. We're I not as sophisticated as you, okay? I'm yeah. not sophisticated. I'm old. <laughs> we don't have I'm the same I'm also in shock because a lot of the dates are in my lifetime. Yeah. That yeah. She's accomplished, and I'm just like, wow, it took that long yeah. for her to be awarded and honored as she should have been. Right. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. It yeah. is. Well, we have a little bit more for you, but first... One more quick break for word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So, <laughs> Mall of America, future destination for Mary Kate and Ashley. <laughs> sure. Um, big project is the point, I think. That's well, that's why she project. worked on it for Mary Kate yes, and she Ashley. Knew. Oh, she knew. Of course. Obviously. <laughs> of course. It was just wouldn't. a big set for their little mini series, <laughs> The Adventures of Mary Kate and Ashley. <laughs> oh, the Do they run around and get lost? And they do ride the roller again? coaster. I don't really remember much other than they, there was same. a roller coaster. That's the all I remember, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it's not like you watch it every day. You're like, like gotta yeah, go well, back to that Mary Kate and Ashley video. I just gotta, I gotta hold on to the old days, Eves. I don't need your judgment of what I gotta do. <laughs> oh no, I'm just saying, like, it's not like we're that fresh. I'm not that fresh up on it because I imagine it wouldn't be a thing that you go back to every day oh, to watch. Sure. <laughs> oh no, never. Of course not. <laughs> oh well, maybe you do. No judgment. No judgment. Here. <laughs> she retired from that practice in 1992, but you know she had a long illustrious career, and she also did a ton of other things besides. That career, she also taught at the University of California, Los Angeles, and served as a director of the University of Southern California Architects Guild. And she was a member of the commission of the California State Board of Architectural Examiners. Wow. Yeah. And quite a mouthful. A whole mouthful. And in the 1990s, she lectured at Howard University, Columbia University, and other schools. And she held seminars for people who were taking the architecture licensing exam. So she kind of worked as this mentor to other people. She said that she didn't have any mentors and or like role models growing up, mm-hmm. but was happy to be one to others, mm-hmm. which I feel like is an important thing oh. to remember, like lift as you are lifting right. yourself. I guess that would be well. a huge problem for anybody who's a first. <laughs> How do you find a mentor exactly. yeah. when you're the one that's paving the way? Yeah, exactly. And to remember, when you, once you have, let's teach others to do so. Yeah, I'm a yeah, big believer amazing. of that. Mm-hmm. I guess you, have, you definitely have to have a lot of resilience to be a person breaking down barriers right. like that. Oh, absolutely, Especially yeah. in a field that is dominated, even now. Uh, by pretty much male mm-hmm. people, yeah. male people, male, male people, <laughs> articulate as always. As, that's us. Hey, this is me. <laughs> but that's one of those words. By. I love the word peoples because it just automatically yeah. makes you sound smarter. Right. Like monies. I, I, like I feel like I'm dumb when I say peoples. No, but that's how I say it. No, no. Oh, I feel like we want you to come a therapy more. session. I'm giving this. I'm getting these like endearing aw looks from you two right now. <laughs> now it's making me more concerned. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But yeah, I mean that's got to be really hard to come into a field that is still predominantly male based mm-hmm. and male dominated, and trying to lead away, trying to do seminars. That's phenomenal as a black woman just paving her way through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She felt that, quote, architecture should be working on improving the environment of people in their homes, in their places of work, and their places of recreation. It should be functional and pleasant, not just in the image of the ego of the architect. Ooh. So that's a, I think that's good insight into how she felt about the work that she did. Mm. Yeah. Once she retired... I, I like this part. <laughs> she lived with her family in Southern California, and she had garden parties in the springtime, <laughs> which sound really fancy. I don't know if I've ever oh, no. been to a garden party before, but I would love to go to one. I've been to one, and How it was sponsored go? by a gin company, and it oh. was beautiful. Oh, oh. Did, Was there a lot of gin there? Oh, so much gin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like gin, is gin the thing that you drink at garden parties, though? Uh, no, you drink like... Um, is it tea? A mint julep type of thing, oh. and that's more, isn't that whiskey and vodka? Yes, and stuff. Mm-hmm. So more on those lines, maybe a little bit of lemonade mm-hmm. and teas yeah. of yeah. sorts, but that would be what I would think of as a garden party. Mm-hmm. 
But if it was my garden party, yes, <laughs> it would have a lot of gin. <laughs> I think we can make our own rules when it comes to the garden party. I think so. I think there's a lot of, like, that croquet game. Yes. Again, which I can uh, reference to Heather's. <laughs> I've never no, seen Heather's. No, you either. Oh, two people. Oh, we're letting Sorry. Samantha down on the reference. We're find today. friends here. Oh, if you if you keep naming things, we'll eventually, eventually get to something. Well, to be fair, you guys also had the SpongeBob reference. I was like, "What?" <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I will watch Heather's. Eves and I. Yes, we have. Let's have a party. Let's have a garden party. Actually, there was oh. a theme party for that at one of the restaurants in Atlanta, oh, and really? they all came dressed up. I don't know what it was for, but it was really cute. They were really cute, all dressed Aww. up like that. Yeah, we can we can make it work. Okay, you can know? we please have a we yes. schedule party. it? Is it is there can like friends? The Heather, is it like this is the sporty Heather? Is it like Spice Girls but with Heathers? No, it's just who's the leader. Okay. And who's so not I can't leader. just be like scary Heather or whatever. No. Okay. You could be <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> Well, <laughs> scary Heather would be one Ona Ryder's character who's not a Heather. She's a oh. Bianca. Oh, I can't do that. I can't. That's ridiculous. Can't. Take that out. Because if I don't know my 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 <laughs> Somebody's Heathers, gonna come for you. Yeah, yeah. they're gonna get me. Um <laughs> yes. but like Heather uh Oh, no, no, the writer's character is the dark-haired one in comparison. Shannon Doherty is in it as well, as oh. well as Christian Slater. Oh, what a cast. She was still really active in all the architectural things going into, you know, the later years of her life. In 2003, she was appointed to the California Architects Board, where she served on the Professional Qualifications Committee and the Regulatory Enforcement Committee. I was really hoping that she was just the. That's she, what was she was the one. <laughs> she I served wanted. as the whole committee. <laughs> oh, I really want her to be the one. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm here for it. I liked it. And she was on a bunch of other boards and committees too, which we won't even go into. In 2008, the AIA gave her the Whitney M. Young Jr. Award, which is an award that recognizes an architect or an organization that embodies the profession's responsibility to address social issues. And she died four years later in 2012 of heart failure at her home in California when she was 85 years old. Oh. Yeah, but she was clearly, you know, recognized for the work that she did while she was alive. But she has gotten a posthumous award as well just this year in July 2019. She became the first black woman to be given the American Institute of Architects Los Angeles gold medal. And that gold medal is given in recognition of a significant body of work with lasting influence on the theory and practice of architecture. And that's the highest honor that the organization awards. So she's, as many people are and have been, awarded things posthumously as well. So it's good to know that a person... You know, we talk about giving people their flowers while they're still alive and for Mm -hmm. them to be awarded while they're alive. But also important to remember people after they've gone and the work that they've done, especially pioneering, it feels like this, and kind of opening it up, like she acted as a mentor to opening it up to other people who may think that they don't have a place in that and feels like this. And I think about this all the time when it comes to, you know, being a first or being a black woman to pioneer in spaces that a lot of people make think of as white spaces, but they aren't our our male spaces. White spaces are spaces for men. Uh, And not having a kind of path or not seeing a path or a way forward for you because you can't see yourself in that organization. But there are, you know, they're there. You know, they're they're, there. And I think having, you know, being able to look back at a legacy like hers and being able to continuously honor her legacy is important when right. it comes to remembering that we can continue forward on the path that she created. There can be more black women architects in the field. Right. They can, you can be licensed. You know, you can fail and you can apply somewhere 19 times and the 20th yeah. one will be the one that you get. So I think that's why I think it's important to look back at a legacy like hers. Right. That's very well put, Eves. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think we talk about on the show a lot the power of seeing yourself somewhere Mm -hmm. and how much that can impact you, especially when you're young, like when you're a child and you don't, if you don't see anybody that looks like you, then you kind of think, well, that must not be for me. Yeah. Right. So I'm glad that we have people like this. We have our female first that are. Yes. Being examples and being mentors. Oh, yeah. And on Female First, I wanted to shout out a couple of other people because I know I mentioned in the beginning that she was not the the first Uh licensed uh, black female architect in the U.S. So the first black architect, period, to become a member of the AIA was Paul Revere Williams in 1923. 
And before Norma, there were Beverly Lorraine Green and Georgia Louise Harris Brown. And they were also thought to be licensed as architects in 1942 and 1949, respectively. And both of them were registered in Illinois. And so both of their stories are interesting as well. And I feel like we talk about this a lot in FIRST and how there was a path for a person to get to a FIRST. There were so many other hands involved, especially Mm -hmm. when it comes to inventions and stuff like that, that a person's FIRST wasn't isolated and also continuing to put into perspective and context why a FIRST is important in terms of like, well, other people had access and there weren't barriers for them necessarily. But, you know, it's... There were, leading up to her becoming, having her first, there were other people who came before her, and Beverly and Georgia were two of those people. And so their stories are really interesting as well. And Brown recognized the barriers she faced because she was a black woman trying to work in architecture. So she learned Portuguese and moved to Brazil in 1953 because she kind of realized there was a burgeoning, growing architecture scene there. And she later got her architectural license there as well in Brazil. And she moved there knowing about all those advancements that were being made. And she was also kind of seeking racial democracy because there was this kind of propaganda machine going on right now saying, look at us. Uh, we have this really open, you know, racial right. situation going on in Brazil, but uh, without needing to go into the, the details of like the racial, yeah, like maneuvers of mm-hmm. everything that happened, and still is happening in Brazil right yeah, now. Right. Like, um, it wasn't obviously as ro- rosy as that propaganda made it seem. So, right. you know, that was the thing. But she also was successful when she got to Brazil and started working there in architecture. But yeah, those are stories as well. If anybody wants to go on that path and continue looking at all these architectural first and pioneering women in it. Yeah. And, yeah. You got a bonus female first, right. listeners, yeah. like a mini female first within the female first. Right. <laughs> it's homework. Oh, yes. Oh. Homework. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've always wanted to assign homework. Here it is. <laughs> Here we go. This is your opportunity. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> you, listeners, go out and find more female first for us and send them our way. Ooh. Yeah, because I think that's about what we have to say uh, about Norma. Um, Thank you so much, as always, Eves. Yeah, it's a joy being here. Such a pleasure. I'm so glad you came. (laughs) Me too. We love it when you come here. (laughs) We do. And we would love for listeners to be able to find you because you do other things than this. You have a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, I feel like I never know (laughs) where I could tell them to find me. But I will say that I also host Unpopular, which is a show about people in history who stood up to the status quo and did things and were often persecuted for it. You can find Unpopular on all the social media things like the Facebook, the Twitter, and the Instagram. And the Instagram. <laughs> and the Instagram. What? And you can listen to the show on all of the also things where you listen to podcasts, wherever you're listening to this one right now. <laughs> and yeah. you can also hear me on This Day in History class, which is also on all of the social media things. And also on the podcast. And also on the podcast. Thing. Yes. <laughs> that thing that you use to listen. If you pick up the phone and... I don't know. That's, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I don't do a good mid, mid-central, mid Midwestern, whatever that old accent is. I'm not oh, good at it. Oh, are you talking it. about transatlantic? Yeah, that thing. <laughs> Get London on the phone. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. I don't want to hear any critiques because okay. it's perfect. Okay, okay. <laughs> and that's London. the only thing just, they say just, over and over again. Just call London. Yeah. Just London in general. Just I like London. it. Just I like that. that. We're not here to criticize you. We're here to no. validate you at all times. Yeah, Thank you. Just to call London. I want to call London. <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life hey, London. To, to debut that impression. So <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I did on the phone. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Uh, you can also email us at stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at stuff I'm never told you. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Andrew Howard. Andrew. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff Mom Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>